Okay, so in the previous video, we've looked at our vision, our hope for what science is or what science could or should be. And in this video, we're going to start looking at what science is actually like. So we've, we, we're going to go from, you know, understanding here is, here is the dream and the vision to science as she is practiced. So to remind you, this, this is what is at stake. This is our enlightenment vision of science. And this is wonderfully interconnected. When, when, when one bit of this falls, it starts to unravel the rest, unless you can stop it quick. So we're going to take this piece by piece. In this video, we're going to look at the scientific method and we're going to see how science as she is practiced compares to our dream and vision of science. So let's take an example. So falsification was an idea put forward by Karl Popper, uh, where he said, you can't ever actually verify a scientific theory. The best you can do is, is falsify it, or the best you can do, because if your theory is true, then you'll never falsify it either. The best you can do is, is to attempt to falsify, to show that there are situations in which it could be falsified. So here's how it works. You, first of all, you develop a theory and Popper's sort of canonical theory is his white swan theory, which is that all swans are white. And from your theory, you can make a prediction. And for example, you can say, okay, when I see a swan, I go outside, I see a swan, that swan will be white. This is a prediction. This is good science. This is predictive science. Okay. And then you go and collect data. And you do that by going outside and you look for swans and you find some and they look like this, for example. And then we ask whether or not the data matches the prediction. So the prediction is when I see a swan, it will be white. The data is a pile of white swans. Does the data match the prediction? Yes, it does. Good. Have we verified our theory? No, we have not. Why not? because our theory, because science is universal. Science holds for all people at all times in all places. We don't want to make particular statements about this swan. We want to make general statements about all swans, right? Because that's science. And all swans are white. If I wanted to verify that, I would have to look at all swans. And because I'm talking about all swans at all times in all places, that includes not just the ones that are in Hong Kong, but the ones that are in America, and not just the ones that are in America now, but the ones that were in America 100 years ago, and the ones that will be in America 2,000 years from now. All swans ever throughout all history. If I want to show that all swans are white, I have to show that I've seen all swans. And I'm never going to be able to look at all swans much less demonstrate if I did happen to look at all swans, that I have definitely looked at all swans that could ever be. So I can't verify this. I can't show it's true, but I can make a prediction and show that in principle, I could show it were false. What would show this to be false? Well, if ever I looked at a swan and that swan was not white, then I would have shown it to be false. And so the more swans I look at, uh, which aren't white, then the more comfortable I become, but I still haven't verified it. I've just failed to falsify it. So now I go out and I collect more data. I make another prediction. When I see more swans, they will be white too. And I go and collect data. And this is my next set of data. And I can ask the question, does the data match the prediction? And the answer is no, it does not. Okay, so what do I now do? It's very simple. I reject my theory because I falsified it. Why would you hold on to a theory that you knew to be false? I now say it is not true that all swans are white. This is science. Yes. And we know it's science because it's following the scientific method. So Popper, at the time, there was this discussion that said, how can we tell the difference between science and non-science? What's the demarcation between those two? And you had people who were doing psychoanalysis and interpretation of dreams and horoscopes. And they said, okay, what's the difference between how can we tell what's science and not science? Because psychoanalysis, uh, psychoanalysts, they can, they can verify what they're saying. You know, you, you, you have some observation and lo and behold, you know, yeah, they can, they can show that their theory aligns to that. And Popper said, it's not, your theories are 
so waffly and you can massage everything that you can agree with anything. There's nothing that I could show you, no dream I could have, no experience, no psychosis or mania that I could have, which you couldn't get your theory to fit. And if you can't tell me the conditions under which something could happen that wouldn't fit your theory, then the fact that something does fit your theory contains no information. Whereas he said, so this is this, that would be pseudoscience. Whereas with real proper science, if you can tell me the conditions under which it wouldn't, there would be an observation that wouldn't fit your theory, then that counts as science. And we go through and we look and we see if I can falsify your theory and I go round and round and round this loop and I keep on going round and any scientific theory is in one of two states. It's either falsified or not yet falsified. Okay. Now, if it's not yet falsified, that might be because you haven't been looking in the right place for your swans, or it might be that your theory is true and you'll never know. But here we go. So this was Popper's idea. So for swans, we reject the theory. We get so we can say that his all swans are white theory is scientific and it is false. Let's take another example. Um, so I don't want to do anything too controversial. Uh, I want to, you know, this is a lots of people can see this course and I, I don't need angry emails. So to pick something that's that's nice and calm as a topic that's not going to get anyone upset, let's pick a theory like evolution. So some people say, you know, Darwin evolution, it's its just a theory. Well, okay, let's take that at face value. Let's see, is it a theory? Okay, first of all, some people say, well, it's its not a theory really because it, it doesn't make predictions, right? You can't predict anything. And of course, that's demonstrably untrue, right? You can make predictions and Darwin himself made predictions. So here's a page from his own notebook where he said, okay, if I start off with a species down here, and over time, I have some mutation, genetic changes, and so on and so forth, right? Over time, this one species over many, many generations is going to diverge until I have separate species. And over time, you know, maybe this species dies out, but these ones are going to carry on and they're going to diverge to have separate species and so on and so forth. So what started off as one species ends up as multiple species. We have this sort of branching tree of life. And and this gives us a prediction, right? We can take this idea and we can say, well, if that happens and if the fossil record shows us what was going on, we should be able to look through the fossil record and we should be able to see that we start with a small number of species and we end up with more species. That's a prediction. And when he actually published this in The Origin of the Species, uh, he neatened it up slightly, but it's the same basic idea. You start at the bottom with a small number of species and you end up at the top with more. Prediction. Good. Now we can go and collect data. We can do this. This is science, right? We're going through, we're following our scientific method. So this was done by a guy called Robert Carroll, uh, writing in Trends in Ecology and Evolution. Uh, now this is, this is a solid scientific evolutionary science journal, right? He's not doing it in some weird, wacko religious journal, right? This is a proper scientific evolutionary paper. And so he plots, so this is not actually species over time. So what he's plotting for each of these here is the number of families within a, a given phylum, but it, it's it's the same basic idea as species. Uh, and he plots it from, from deep time way back in the Vendian all the way up to the, 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 the Neogene here. And so let's, so we've, we've got our data and now we can compare the data to prediction. So here is the prediction and we have the data and do they match? Well, let's have a look. So let's start with chordates. Okay, we all know some chordates and chordates work pretty well. I mean, something happened like at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, chordates stopped doing as well as they had been. But, you know, basically they start off with a couple and, and, and they get more and more biodiverse as they go. So chordates are basically with the program. We're good. Tick. Have we verified the prediction? No, we've only not yet falsified it. Okay, well, but we can go and we can look for more swans and we can we can look at something else. Now, arthropods, arthropods are awesome, right? Text, I mean, look at this, right? Everything, I say, if something happened in the Triassic, never mind. But from the Triassic onwards, I mean, look at this. This is this is just a beautiful branching out. This is this is this is good. We've not yet verified the prediction, but we haven't yet falsified it. Okay, 
uh, Porifera, okay, so this is sponges. And, okay, sponges had problems. Uh, they, they diversified up through the Cambrian and then, and then Ordovician, they stopped and then they just got bored through to the Carboniferous. And then they had another go in the Permian and gave up in the Triassic and had another go in the Jurassic and then gave up in the Paleogene. Yeah, Porifera didn't do very well, did they? I think, I think they hadn't been reading their Darwin. Uh, it's all right. It's all right. Let's, let's look on, see what else we get. Okay. Uh, Platyhamenthes. Um, that's, that's, uh, sea slugs. Um, and sea slugs did not get the memo. Sea slugs just, they started with some and they finished with some and in between they had some. That is not what Darwin was expecting when he predicted what the fossil record should look like. Um, Brachiopods, brachiopods did even worse. I mean, they they peaked in the Devonian, right? They were they were great guns up to the Devonian, and then they gave up. Um, okay, now full disclosure, I told you this the other week anyway. I'm not a biologist, right? I can look at this and I can kind of squint and I can say, does that fit or not? But let's let's go back to Robert Carroll, right? He's the biologist. He's the evolutionary biologist. He's the expert here. What does he say? Does he think the data matches the prediction? Here is the abstract to his paper in which he published the previous graph. Okay, so he says, these fields of study show that large scale evolutionary phenomena cannot be understood solely on the basis of extrapolation from processes observed at the level of modern populations and species. Patterns and rates of evolution are much more varied than had been conceived of by Darwin or the evolutionary synthesis. Now, that is a long and scientific way of saying no. These data do not match up with a prediction okay so evolution we're going to do science right okay so we follow through the scientific method we've got our flow diagram so what we're going to do is we're going to reject evolutionary theory because that's what we need to do because science and so we can see what robert carroll does is he says new concepts of information need to be integrated into an expanded evolutionary thesis Okay, he would have rejected it, but actually what he did was fudge the bits that didn't fit and made a new prediction. So he doesn't know why they don't fit, but we can do it if, if we do some more research, right? The difference between this theory has been falsified and we need to do some more research is stop giving me money for my research and give me more money for my research. Right. So what he has found, we need an expanded evolutionary thesis, uh, synthesis, right? He's saying we should do more. We should, we should, we should give me more money. Give me more research. Let me expand evolution, which is not what Popper thought should be going on. Popper thought that what should be going on is, is we should throw the theory out. So here's, here's the puzzle. Um, here's the logic that we have. Scientific research follows the scientific method. That seems obvious enough. I mean, it's there in the name, right? Why would they call it the scientific method if science didn't care for it? Um, okay. And research on evolutionary theory does not follow the scientific method, um, given the choice between throwing it out and fudging it and ask for more money, we ask for more money. Now that tells us that evolutionary theory is not scientific. Okay, I shall let that sink in, right? So you get these, right, these, these, you know, crazy evolutionists, uh, anti-evolutionists in America who say, who say, you know, evolution is not science. They're not crazy, right? They carefully listened to what they were told about falsificationism in their science lessons at school. And they know that they've been told and they learned it well, diligent sensible good students they know that scientific research follows the scientific method and they can see because they're not dumb they can see that evolutionary theory does not follow the scientific method and they can do logic because they're entirely reasonable people and they can see that evolutionary theory is not scientific right they don't need to be anti-science to say that evolution is not science arguably they are pro-science they want to keep science for good science 
There is, however, there's another way to look at this problem. Here we go. Option two. Evolutionary theory is scientific. We're just going to say that. That is an article of faith, if you will, if you'll pardon the expression. Okay. Evolutionary theory is scientific and research on evolutionary theory does not follow the scientific method because we've just seen that and we can't deny the knowledge of our own eyes. Therefore, scientific research does not have to follow the scientific method. Right? If someone looks at evolutionary theory and says, this is not science, they're not crazy. Not necessarily crazy. They might just be looking at the scientific method they were taught from Popper at school and saying, it's not, it's just not. The way we get around this is by saying, we're gonna throw out the scientific method that Popper gave us. Now, are we comfortable with that? We can preserve evolution as a scientific theory, provided we abandon the scientific method that Popper handed down to us. Now, this is what is at stake, right? This is the vision that I cast in the last lecture, okay? If the scientific method falls, this was our guarantor of objectivity, of universality, of truth. It was the scientific method that made things demonstrable and traceable and systematic. This is what gave us certainty. And first, actually, Popper said it doesn't give you certainty. Um, Pre-Popper people thought, yes, we can verify science. And Popper said, no, we're going to abandon certainty because you can only falsify it. And now we're going to find that it, it gets worse than that. It's, it, it unravels. Like I said, as soon as one thing goes, it starts to unravel. So Popper recognized certainty was gone. And now we're recognizing that demonstrability has gone because we don't like the scientific method anymore. And just to see how interconnected this is for those of you who watched the last video a long time ago, this is what is at stake, right? We can't just throw out one bit and hope the rest of it is not going to notice. So, what went wrong? And for those of you who like long words, the answer is under determination. It's probably been clipped because of my picture on this, but that says under determination. Now, again, I'm not a biologist. I'm not going to try and nail my colours to the mast for biology, but let's illustrate this with physics because, right, physics isn't that complicated. We're not, we're not going to look way back in time at fossil records and argue over how fossilization processes work. Let's bring this up to something we can do now, okay? So let's consider a mass on an inclined plane, right? This is proper. You can get your head around this, right? This is proper physics. Now, let's consider that this mass has a mass m. It's in a gravitational, uniform gravi gravitational field g. So it has a normal reaction force off it, mg cos theta, because the plane is inclined at an angle of theta, which means that it's got a resultant force going down the slope of mg sine theta. Now, if it's about a distance s from the bottom of the slope, I hope you're keeping up. Um, I'm not going to test you on this later, but, you know, just try and keep up. Okay, so what we can now say is we can say s equals ut plus half at squared. So we can work that out, rearrange that for t, and we can find out how long it would take this block to go another thing. So we know what s is. Let's say it's going to be a meter. We know what a is. It's that because f equals ma because Newton, which means that if we have a one meter long ramp, we've got 10 meters per second squared for gravity, and we've got a 45 degree angle, then it would hit the bottom of the ramp in 0.532 seconds. Good. I hope that's all clear. Now, we did this logic by saying because Newton, which means if Newtonian mechanics is correct, then we can do this experiment and we can measure a time of 0.532 seconds for our mass to go down the slope. I'll say that again because it's important. If Newtonian mechanics is correct, then we will measure a time of 0.532 seconds to go down the slope. This is science because this is falsifiable because, flip this round, if we do not measure a time of 0.532 seconds, then Newtonian mechanics is not correct. We can go to Popper and we can say, yes, we know the circumstances under which we will falsify Newtonian mechanics. These are them. Set that up, time it, and see what time you have. So, let's go and do that. So, here we go. 
We've got the setup exactly like we planned. We've got ourselves a slope that's one meter long at 45 degrees. And we have ourselves a mass under a uniform gravitational field, and we have ourselves a timer. So this here is Sophie, she's a scientist. This here is Benny, he's a scientist. And we're gonna do this experiment now, live. So, I'm gonna count to three. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go. Stop. And the time says 0.0. 0 0.90. 0 0.90, not 0 0.532. High five. High five. Okay, you saw it here first. I'm gonna recap on what you've just seen. If Newtonian mechanics is correct, then we will measure a time of 0.532 seconds, which is logically identical to the statement, if we do not measure a time of 0.532 seconds, then Newtonian mechanics is not correct. We've just gone outside, we've just done that experiment, and we measured a time which was not 0.532 seconds. We've just falsified Newtonian mechanics. Your textbooks are wrong. I'm gonna get a Nobel Prize. <clears throat> it's possible that I won't, full disclosure. Okay, so <laughs> given, given that I'm not gonna get a Nobel Prize for this, what just happened? What went wrong? Why have we just not falsified Newtonian mechanics? 